This episode brought to you by Tomes, which is a natural sleep and sound healing portal helping people globally to get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer through Tomes.com. That's www.taumhoms.com. It's My Right Stuff with your host, Grammy Award winning record producer and inventor, Toby Wright. My Right Stuff is brought to you by Tones, a natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tones.com. That's www.taumhoms.com. I'm your announcer, Grinnin Barrett. Here's Toby. Hey, hey, I'm Lord Toby Wright, and this is My Right Stuff News. And welcome to the My Right Stuff Good News Network. Let's kick things off with the music news. So Happy It Hurts is the upcoming 15th studio album by Canadian singer-songwriter Brian Adams. The album is the singer's first to be released on the BMG Rights management label. Franz Ferdinand celebrate their 20-year career with their newest greatest hits album, Hits to the Head. The compilation collects the band's biggest hits and features two new songs, Billy Goodbye and Curious, which they recorded last year. And both tracks were co-produced by Stuart Price. And that album comes out today. Well, Ghost released their fifth album titled Impira. The band was formed in Sweden in 2006 by Tobias Forge. Forge performs as Papa Emeritus, the dark frontman who takes a new form with each album. The lyrics are rich in Christian allusions and the resurrection. The band members conceal their faces behind elaborate masks. PJ Harvey releases the Hope 6 Demolition Project Demos, a collection of 10 unreleased demos written for the ninth PJ Harvey studio album. It includes demos of The Wheel and The Community of Hope also featuring brand new artwork with cover art based on a drawing by Polly Jean Harvey, plus previously unseen photos. All right, let's go on over to film and TV news. The Last Days of Ptolemy Gray premieres on Apple+. Plus. Samuel L. Jackson stars in this new six-episode series based on Walter Mosley's acclaimed bestseller about family, memory, and legacy. Formula One Drive to Survive Season 4 gets its release on Netflix. The show has drawn in a massive global audience in recent years and has become a regular feature on the F1 calendar with the latest episodes to drop during the second F1 testing weekend. Producers Box to Box Films wouldn't have believed their luck given the spectacular events of the 2021 season that saw Max Verstappen crowned king of the grid ahead of seven-time champion Lewis Hamilton under extremely controversial circumstances. This season's going to be great. Well, the Hyperions is out in theaters. In 1960, Professor Ruckus Mandelbaum invents a device, the Titan Badge, that offers humans superpowers and creates an unusual family of superheroes who rise to fame and prestige. But over time, the family fractures and things fast forward to 1979 when two original superheroes go to extraordinary lengths to get their Titan badges back. Ryan Reynolds stars in The Atom Project. A time-traveling pilot teams up with his younger self and his late father to come to terms with his past while saving the future. And that's in theaters now. So take a date. All right, let's go on over to the world of sports. Well, in Formula One news, this weekend is final testing in Bahrain before the start of the 2022 season next week. And in gigantic F1 news, drum roll please, eh, there we go, Haas has announced the return of Kevin Magnussen to the team. 
He'll race this season alongside Mick Schumacher. Kick ass, Kevin. We'll be watching, buddy. In the Premier League, leaders Manchester City play Crystal Palace, Liverpool play Brighton, and Chelsea take on Newcastle. On over to Gear and Tech News. Well, III released their TMA2 Studio Wireless Plus headphones. Making music while monitoring through wireless headphones has traditionally been viewed as a bit of a no-no, with the latency introduced by the usual Bluetooth connection being too high to make it feasible. Quality can suffer when you ditch the cable, too, and there's also the issue of reliability. However, working in collaboration with forward-thinking electronic music producer Richie Houghton, III now claims to have solved these problems with the TMA2 Studio Wireless Plus headphones, thanks to the new W Plus Link technology, which has been specifically developed for music creation. The TMA2 promises ultra-low latency, lossless audio, robustness, and stability, so you won't need to worry about dropouts. These studio headphones can also connect via Bluetooth 5.0 when required to, or via the included coiled hi-fi cable, and are said to deliver 80 hours of playback time. Comfort is also a consideration, of course, and memory foam cushioning is designed to make sure the TMA2s deliver it. The TMA2 Studio Plus headphones are hitting stores now and cost $350. You can find III here. And that's all the news that's making the news this week, March 11th, 2022. Now over to you, Lord Rage. Oh, (laughs) hey, thank you, Toby, and welcome back to My Right Stuff, which is a film, TV, sports, music, adventure, and inspirational lifestyle podcast. I'm your host, Lord Toby Rage Wright, and today I have a very, very special guest. He's a very talented man. His name is Christian James Hand, and if you're unaware of this man, let me clue you in. I found him running the Sessions IG Live on Instagram, which is a live show that breaks down the tracks of a particular song. And then he puts them back together, but I'll let him explain the process. It's pretty cool. But before I introduce him, I want to thank you, all of our supporters who stream, download, watch, and support My Right Stuff. Keep spreading the word, my friends. We really do appreciate it, and it really does help. Thank you. Be sure to click on our show notes below to follow our link tree for a full list of all the channels we stream on, as well as all of our sites and social media platforms. If you'd like to donate to My Right Stuff, please do. And please follow our support link. Every single dollar helps support My Right Stuff crew who make all of this possible. And of course, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, as well as the podcast channel of your choice, so you never, ever miss a single episode. Well, after this episode, please head on over to MyRightStuff.com, click on the store tab to pick up some snazzy merch for those bodies, which would also make an ideal present for your nearest and dearest. Get them now. Well, before we get started on today's episode, I'd like to introduce my co-host, the man who's old enough to know what a cassette tape and a Bic pen have in common, but young enough not to care. My distinguished co-host, Sir Gareth Dighton. Hey, Gareth, how are you today? Hey, Toby, my friend, how's things rocking with you? Oh, pretty darn good today. Always a pleasure to always a pleasure to catch up with you. Superb. Always pleased to hear it. Always Absolutely. Pleased. So I understand you have some new music for us. I do indeed. Uh, what I, I've been really listening to and really loving at the moment, there's a new release by Andy Morin and Back Xwash called Dig Yourself a Grave, Canada's finest horrorcore rapper in collaboration mode, and it is just sweet. Uh, I've also been listening to the new album, or the latest album, by a band called Christian Fitness from the UK. It's um, Falco from Future to the Left and McCluskey doing his own thing. It's a bit noisy and a bit clever in equal measure. Wow. Um and I have to admit, I'm still really enjoying Snapped Ankles' album from last year, The Forest of Your Problems. Um, I caught them playing a Green Man Festival in the summer, and they've never been really far away ever since. You know, it's a it's an album that I keep on going back to to listen to, just because it just completely floats my boat. I love it. That's fantastic. It sounds like a great combination of wonderful music. Well, you know me, T. I certainly like to mix it up, and um, there's kind of something there for everyone. I feel. Yeah. Amen, brother. I love it all, too. You certainly do. I'll be sure and check out those releases as well. Please do. And thank you for turning me on to them. You're most welcome, my friend. 
Well, Gareth, today I'd like to introduce you to our talented and very fun guest, Christian James Hand who you can find on KLOS Radio here in Los Angeles with Frosty, Heidi, and Frank uh, with the studio sessions, taking apart popular songs and reassembling for your listening pleasure. He also has a show on uh, Instagram called The Sessions IG Live. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a nice warm welcome to Christian James Hand. Hey, brother, how are you today? Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to do it like this for the whole show. That way I can't get into trouble. I'll just That's blame right. it on the puppet. <laughs> I didn't say it, the public said it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. All right. And he's a ventriloquist, too, ladies and gentlemen. All and right. we're off and running immediately. <laughs> How's it going? It goes, man. Pretty How's good. it go for you Yeah, guys? pretty good, my friend. It goes good. pretty well, pretty well. That's I'd like to introduce you to my – I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Sir Gareth Hello. Dighton. How are you doing? Hold on. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christian. A round thank of applause. You. Thank you very much, my friend. <laughs> he had a wolf whistle as well. <clears throat> my, my, oh, yeah, yeah. I got it all. It's like <laughs> the morning show radio. <clears throat> my actual day is exactly. certainly kind of got, got that little bit brighter already for that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, least let's, do. well, let's drop the needle right here <laughs> on my right stuff. We like to get a bit of history on our guest for our beautiful audience. And I believe you've got origins that actually stem back to the UK and uh, even in Wales, I believe. I do. My mother's which, from Mountain Which I have Ash. to say is about five miles, five miles that way. Nice. And my, uh, my grandfather was a, was a coal miner. Nice. Ah. With the emphysema yeah, to yeah. to prove it, All right? And then he uh, he became the he became the lamp lighter once he couldn't go down the pits anymore, which is crazy to think that that's like you know yeah, one totally. generation away, right? Bonkers. And then yeah, I, I was born in Stoke on Trent, and then I've lived in London for uh, seven years until nineteen eighty three, eighty four, and then I went to Long Island. Um, to Port Jefferson, the nice. gateway to the North Shore. We have a ferry <laughs> right. that brings everybody <laughs> over from Connecticut. It yeah, was uh, right. it was amazing when Hurricane uh, uh, was it no it was Gloria when Hurricane Gloria hit. Uh, it was fantastic. If what you needed to survive was uh, was a, a, a drummer made out of uh, seashells right. that looked like a frog, or a fisherman made out of seashells that looked like a frog, because that was all okay. our stores had in them to help us through the, uh, through the hurricane. It's great. It's amazing. Completely unprepared. Fantastic. Well, that must've been a big culture shock for you. Uh, it was, uh, it, the second, the actually moving to LA was a bigger culture shock, believe it or not. But yeah, Long Island in 1983 was a, uh, my parents' joke was, you know, after living in Botswana for six years, that my parents' joke was that we had promised ourselves that we would never live in a third world country again, and we found ourselves in one. Yeah, yeah, you did. I lived like, uh, <laughs> my, my joke is that I lived a John Hughes film for my high school career to the point where somebody actually, honestly, spray painted Save Ferris <laughs> on my high school. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it was like. It was, it, you know, like it was art imitating life, imitating art, imitating life. It was a the little Twilight Zone. <laughs> that moment. All right. Uh huh. But nonetheless, I, 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 I'm incredibly grateful to have lived in like a small, picturesque, literal postcard town on Long Island. I mean, it was, uh, it was actually pretty cool, even though it, it had many things about it that sucked. Looking back, I'm really it's grateful cool. for it. Right, so right. many years ago, you were offered a tour with PM Dawn as a lighting tech, and then you ended up as a drum tech. Can you tell us a little bit more yeah. about that scenario? Yes, I uh, st uh, when I graduated from high school, I had the sl I mean, graduated from college, I had the sliding doors moment of either going and getting a real job, or I was offered to be the lighting tech for PM Dawn uh, at one show at the Jacob Javits Center that then was going to turn into some nice. possible touring. And uh, I left on that, and then the budget wasn't sufficient for us to actually have a lighting guy, and I had become pretty close with Prince B at that point. And I went to him, and I was like, dude, I'm getting fired. And he was like, not on my watch. What other job can you do? And I said, well, you know, I can drum tech and 
I've done this before, so stage managing. And he was like, all right, just be the drum tech. And then, you know, sort of like an ad hoc helping coordinate the staging of everything, uh, which was, you know, actually a way more fun gig than being the lighting designer or lighting operator, to be honest with you. Um, sure. And did that for two and a half, almost three, two and a half, three years. Okay. Uh, which allowed me to go on the road nice. with Peter Gabriel. Uh, allowed me right. to go to Europe and do uh, do France with him. And it was really uh, a, a beautiful, beautiful experience. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I didn't want to be a roadie for the rest of my life. Um, right. I'm a bit of a, it's, that's a, you got to have a, it's a, that's a special breed. You know? Oh, yeah. And, you know, being on the road with, with Peter Gabriel, you got to, like, work with the real dudes who'd been doing it forever. And, like, everybody had an Iron Maiden story because everybody had toured with Iron Maiden yeah. at least once in their career. And right. uh, I got offered uh, to go on the road with uh, nice. Pink Floyd, which initially sounded yeah. like a really cool idea. And then I found out that the tour was, like, Ooh, two shit. years long or something. And I was like, no <laughs> way am I doing that. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, it was like one of those things where I don't know if either of you had this situation, but you could have the thing where you realize if you do that, you're probably going to get concreted into yeah. that life forever yeah, yeah. because you'll right. just get used to it. And then you'll wake up at 60 and suddenly think, holy shit, I've just been working for Iron Maiden <laughs> for the last 40 years of my life. Like, how did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I, I I kindly turned that down and then I went to B and I said, listen, I don't have a fucking job and I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, well, I'll, I'll get you a job at the at the record label if you want it. And that's how I ended up working at G Street, which is how I ended up going on the road with the Gravediggers and doing that whole thing with them for a couple of years, which was absolutely some of my fondest and craziest memories. Stunning. So how did, how did producer Prince Paul influence you? uh paul was amazing uh one of my favorite okay. things about prince paul is that he doesn't give a shit and he's got an outrageous sense of humor uh we uh we had to uh we had to do the the clean version they didn't he didn't want to call to do the clean version of the record but you had to do a clean version to be able to get it into mm -hmm. walmart's yeah, yeah. and that sort of right, shit. Right. And the thing that yep. we didn't realize, because we came from, you know, big cities, that once you got out on tour and you got into like the, 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 the quieter states, um, that uh, Walmart was the only place that you could get the record. Yeah. It was like oh, wow. Walmart was literally like the post office, the supermarket, the, the gun shop, the detective agency, the pet grooming, everything was in the Walmart. And if you weren't in the Walmart, you weren't going to sell any records. So he acquiesced right. and we had to go to the Hit Factory. I'm sure you remember the Hit Factory, Toby Wright. What a great spot that was. Did you do any records at the Hit Factory? Oh, I mixed Alice in Chains uh, Unplugged. Uh, what an amazing studio that was. So we went to the Hit Factory oh, yeah. to do the radio edits. And, uh, you know, there's like a number of ways you can do radio edits. You can either do the reverse where you take the curse and you blah, blah, or you just do a right. dropout, which is the silence. Yeah. Prince Paul decided that what we were going to do was uh, he turned to the engineer and said, what sound effects CDs? Because this was in the day of CDs. He's like, what sound effects CDs do you have? And the guy was like, listed them. And one of them was farm <laughs> animals. And he said, all right, we're going to we're gonna do the farm animals. So Paul and I sat there, not high, because he doesn't smoke weed. We sat there not high for like three hours, putting like, yo, mother, <laughs> into the radio, the edit version, the clean That's version awesome. of the Gravediggers record. And I urge everybody... I can't say what the European title of it is, which is weird because it's actually the title. So in America, it was called Six Feet Deep. In Europe, yeah. they were allowed to call it what they really wanted to call it, which is considering the context of the organization and what it was about. The European title is without a doubt one of the greatest album titles of all time. So Google that. It's incredible. And I have a copy of it. When I was over there, I'm like, I'm fucking buying this because this is too good uh yeah so and then we were gonna find that it's it really is brilliant and it was it was a massive disappointment that they couldn't call it over call it that over here um because six feet deep just wasn't as clever um right so we were on the road in uh europe we had just arrived we did uh rehearsals at uh the whatever the iron maiden rehearsal studios were in in 
in London and we did them there. And then we went up to Scotland. And when we awoke in Scotland, the RZA was no longer on tour with us and had headed back to oversee the Wu-Tang clan because they were sort of taking off at the same time. And right. um, the choice was given to us by the tour, given to the guys by the tour manager of we can either continue on or we can drop out because we don't have the full complement. And the other three were like, well, this is kind of fucked up that we don't get to go on and do this because of this. So if we can keep going, let's keep going. And uh, they said, you know, well, what, what do you want to do about the Riz's parts? And uh, Prince Paul was like, well, you know, Christian can do them on a couple of the songs. And I was like, Are you what now? And uh, oh. one of my jobs was uh, I would, Prince Paul, I don't remember when it started, but Prince Paul suddenly wanted me to do like a rock and roll intro to the thing. So I was like, from the depths of hell, like this whole thing, the grave diggers, and it reverbed and all this sounded amazing. So I had this live mic backstage and I would have a glass of wine in one hand and a joint hanging out of my mouth and I would literally just be doubling whatever was being said on stage because I had nothing else to do. I mean, setting up a hip hop <laughs> fucking stage is like two turn <laughs> literally two turntables, three microphones and a mixer, job done. Right. So then I'm just sitting backstage and I just feel like, yeah, motherfucker, fuck my dick, bring it on. Couldn't believe it. What did you say? Like, I'm just doing that while all the roadies are looking at me like, what is that guy's fucking situation? Yeah. So I knew all the words. So I would get right, invited out on stage, and uh, Prince Paul invented the character of, uh, of MC Skullcap. And uh -huh. uh, I would get uh, introduced uh, by the by the organization uh, as the Great White Hope out of Shaolin. And yeah. this is pre-Eminem. Uh, so the only <laughs> real white hip hop guys at this point, I believe, are like MC Search vanilla ice, and yeah. uh, Vanilla Ice, <clears throat> and of course uh, nice. MC Skullcap. Nice, of course. So I would you get to go out best, and find my myself on stage with like you know thirty thousand people in front of you, or however many it was when we were at the big arenas, and uh, you know because of the tour was us, J. Were the Damager, Gangstar, uh, Public Enemy, Ice Cube. And it was supposed to be Arrested Development and they dropped out, which was actually a relief because they had like 65 people in that band. So it would have actually been a, <laughs> a bit of a, a top heavy situation. Um, yep. So it was it was a huge tour. And I got to be on stage doing rapping, uh, wearing a big okay. public enemy hockey jersey or a Grave Diggers hockey jersey with my pants around my knees and just a, a complete nice. a complete embarrassment, a, a total... <laughs> A complete embarrassment. Uh, I'll be honest yeah. with you. You have to go find some video of that. But thank God there is none. This is pre cell phone. This is pre everything. Like it happened in the moment and it is, it is frozen in amber in the minds of the viewers only. Um, okay. But it was also amazing. <laughs> fun. amazing. And I, uh, I remember we, when we finished the uh, when we finished that tour, we finished at a place called Subterranea in yeah. London or Subterranean, which was an underground, okay. literally underground venue. And the RZA, uh, RZA joined us. I, Have I'm, you been there? I'm aware of it, yeah, rather than be there. Yeah, I haven't. No, it's dirty. It's fucking awesome. It feels dangerously dangerous, especially in like '94 at that time. And uh, I remember. The RZA joined us, but Prince Paul still wanted me to come out for this song called Bang Your Head because it was a little bit more metal and aggro, and it was like, just jump around and bang, yell, bang your head. And I remember jumping around, and then there was a pit started. So I jumped okay. into the pit, and I'm smashing uh -oh. around because I'm an industrial kid, so I'm smashing around in the pit, and suddenly I, I hit this, this wall, and then the wall put one hand into the top of my pants and the other hand around the base of my neck, and then deadlifted me up to about head height and then threw me into the pit. I landed, fucked my back up, which, by the way, I still suffer today. And when I was in the dressing room downstairs, icing my back and lying there in huge pain, Shaq Diesel walked in, was like, holy shit, dude, I had no idea that you were with the gravediggers. I just thought you were some asshole. I'm so fucking sorry. And I was lying there just looking at him like, it's all right, Shaq. We're good, man. It's all right. It's all right. Meanwhile, I probably should have sued because I have a chiropractic bill with the likes of God knows what, partly due to Jack Diesel. Uh, but it was amazing days. I mean, getting to see, you know, like Gangstar, one of my favorite organizations of all time. So getting to, I had an, oh, yeah. an, an incredible lunch with them in a, in a Burger King in Paris. 
Uh, there was one time when I was hanging out and, and Chuck D uh, pawned uh, Flavor Flav off on me. Like I was wearing this public enemy hockey jersey that I'd bought somewhere else. And Chuck and Flavor were walking. And then Chuck was like, yo, man, come here for a second. I walked in. He's like, where'd you get that fucking jersey from? And I was like, I don't remember. But it's he was like, that's not you know, auth- authorized merch, but it's badass. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. And blah, 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 blah. And then I turned and he had ghosted. And it was me and Flavor Flav standing there. And Flavor just looks at me and goes, <laughs> what are we doing, man? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up going to fucking jail, whatever it is that we end up doing for however long we end up doing it, Mr. Flav. But okay. And then Flavor Flav and I spent about three hours meandering around. And uh, I don't remember any of it because I was so high at that point uh, that it's <laughs> most of that tour is a blur. But nonetheless, the blurs that I remember were extraordinary yes. blurs. Hell yeah. <laughs> that sounded like lots of fun. That sounded like some good shit. It really was. I mean, getting to be... Uh, behind the scenes on a on a on a hip hop tour that is uh with you know those yeah. that level of artist was extraordinary as a right. kid who loved hip hop in high school in like 1986 when it was like DJ Red Alert DJ from the Red Zone on Kiss FM or whatever it was on right. a Saturday night and getting to hear that stuff and then flash forward and you're literally on the road with heroes as yeah. honestly as a white kid from Port Jefferson, high, you know, hyphen Kingsbury, it was extraordinary. There was one one day we were in a we were playing an arena, and I don't remember where it was. And I was in the base in the downstairs where all the the dressing rooms were, and it was me, Ice Cube, Mac Ten, Chuck D, Prince Paul, Fruquam, Poetic, J. Ru the Damager, uh, both of the guys from Guru and and Premier, and somebody else. And they just sat there telling stories to each other and laughing about the Chitlin circuit. And like, cause they would all be on buses back in the day. They'd get to do like three songs and they would just do tours awesome. where all of them were together and they were like kids. So they were telling like their origin stories. And this is years before the internet exists, but that podcast yeah. would have been fucking amazing. Cause oh, A, yeah. they can all tell incredible stories. B, they're funny as fuck. And uh-huh. they were feeding off of each other. And it was hours. It was at least two hours of just sitting there and hearing these incredible, incredible stories of them back when they were, you know, 18 years old or whatever it was when they first, you know, started the game. But it was it was really that was there was some really incredible moments that, you know, only exist up here, which is really kind of cool about it. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. (coughs) Yeah. Um, After that tour, you kind of took a little bit of a career detour or detour or I'm not sure if detour is the right word, but you started working in Seven Willow Street, which sounded like it was an absolute incredible venue. And you were certainly in the right place at um, the right time to work with some incredible bands. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. I, well, once I, so I got offered a, a promotion at the record label. I got along really well with the uh, head of the record label, who's a guy by the name of John Baker. Mm-hmm. an Englishman. And uh, I think he took a bit of a shine to me because I was, I don't know if he saw he didn't have sons. He had a daughter. So I think he sort of saw a little bit of, you know, like uh, not necessarily a prodigy, but like wanted to mentor me. Mm-hmm. And there was an opportunity there for me to become the A&R director of the record label at like 24 years, 25 years old oh. at that point, probably. Nice. Yeah, and cool. um, I didn't want the gig because I had realized in working there that they really didn't care about it, the music. Like it was, it was all about shipping units and selling units. I mean, yeah. you know, they cared about the music as long as it sold at the end yeah. of the day. Right. Because we were part of Island, which was part of Polygram. So the indie ethos had been eaten up by, you know, literally Polygram at that point was in a huge black building mm-hmm. in Midtown New York that looked, it looked like the Death Star. It was fucking horrible. Uh-huh. You know, like everything was, you know, like had to bill through. Like you couldn't just grab paper towels. Like literally everything had to be signed off on. And I was like, this doesn't really have anything to do with music. And I I want to do music. So I was looking for a gig. And there was this really small venue called Seven Willow Street in Porchester that was run by Fred, who was an absolute madman. And he would book 
insane acts like Leica and the Cosmonauts and then be pissed when 15 people were at the show. <laughs> I'd be like, you put fucking Leica and the Cosmonauts, bro. I mean, they're amazing. Don't get me wrong, but I, I don't, the fan base is limited to say the, I think we're lucky there were 15 fucking people. Um, right? <laughs> but, you know, also face to face and the Goo Goo Dolls and the band called the Bogmen, who were absolutely one of the greatest live acts I've ever seen that got eaten up by Arista, unfortunately. And my favorite of all the things I saw there was Soul Coughing doing that first record and that first Soul Coughing oh, record. Yeah. It's just nice. absolutely spectacular. Yeah, it's incredible album. For and great. getting to, is it Ruby Vroom is the first one? It is, right? Ruby Vroom um, yep. with yep. Screenwriters Blues and all that stuff on it. So getting to see if if all I got out of that job was getting to see that band live, then that paid for itself. Um, and it was really cool. There was like a ska scene of all these kids that were from around the area, and they would do these ska Sundays or these ska yeah, Saturdays or Sundays where they take like the whole day and they would do ska festivals. Nice. And it was a really cool nexus point. My buddy scotty mars would do this thing called bounce where he would literally put like a bouncy castle in the venue and they would do techno all night so i got to see <laughs> i got cool. to see the crystal method nice right before busy child broke right uh, when i think it was keep hope alive or whatever that first 12 inch was and yeah, it yeah. was right. one of the sickest things it was like keep hope alive i think was the first i believe so yeah um, i believe it was the, has like the martin luther king sample on it or whatever it is yeah. and yeah their live show was so bonkers. It was so fucking punk rock because it was so great to see them like expand to playing with this enormous stage set and 900 keyboards because all they had was like one little sampler rack in between them. Yeah. And then they had two keyboards that were MIDI. They weren't even MIDI controllers because I don't think those existed at that point. So they were keyboards right. that were MIDI'd in, but they were on these huge springs. And they would push the springs all the way over and play them and then let the keyboard go and it go wah, 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 and they would catch it and then they would keep playing. And it was the closest you could get to doing guitar tricks on yeah, a yeah. keyboard. Right. <clears throat> and then it's the fucking Crystal Method. And you know, like the Crystal Method drum sound is unlike anyone in Electronica, their drum sound. Like nobody yep. else ever came close. Mm -hmm. Like go back and listen to Busy Child now and it hammers. Yeah, so, so I got to see oh, yeah. those dudes do that, which was just amazing. And, you know, all of these cool, like, I, it was just really a, a, a great scene out of that place. And through that, I met the kids that threw out the t-shirts for the local radio station. And I'd always okay. wanted to be a radio DJ and had mm -hmm. kind of, uh, I'd done it in college and thought that that was my radio career, you know, yeah. full, right. full tilt. And then I saw these kids and I was like, oh, maybe this is a way that I can at least get into the radio station. And it's actually a way cooler job than this because I just ended up at the end of the day being the you know assistant manager of, an, of a small nightclub in Portchester. And there wasn't really a place to go. Yeah. So I hit them up and I was like, hey, what do I have to do to get a job throwing out T-shirts at shows? And they were like, oh, you just got one. And that was it. Because mm -hmm. I'd been Sweet. working with them coordinating. Because <laughs> the really cool thing was the, the venue was like 500 to 700 people. Yeah, and it was right. right outside Manhattan, so a band could go in, do Irving Plaza, get in the van, drive out to us, and then the tri-state area opened up, so we were a really cool little staging place. And then yeah. additionally, we had X107, which was the radio station, so Delamitri okay. and all those bands came through and just needed a place to sell fucking 700 tickets. Yeah. And fill Sweet. the place because the radio nice. station would promote it and send yeah, the band yeah. down and blah, 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 blah. So that was how I ended up beginning my radio career was I started out throwing T-shirts in the in the van. That's killer. That's pretty and cool. Then you yeah. moved to L.A., right? And, yeah, well, uh, I was on the radio was... station. I was on the radio station there for six months and I went from the overnights to the afternoon. And then okay. one day got invited to the radio station for an early meeting, which generally means you're fired. And uh, <laughs> whenever yeah. you got a message from the station being like, hey, can you come in early today? It, it never bodes no, well. Never, nev never, so, ever uh, ends well. never ends well. And nobody ever calls you in early to be like, hey, we're going to be a pay raise. It's going to be great. Yeah, and a right. company car and a parking space. That never occurs. So <laughs> I went in and sat down and they were like, you know, uh, so we're, we're flipping format to country. And uh, you're not going to be doing country. 
So you have two choices. You can either stay in New York and fend for yourself and try to get a gig in New York on radio, which is right. virtually impossible, yeah, or right. we'll ship you and your girlfriend and your life to LA and you can become the night guy on our sister station in New York, in LA. And it was, you know, that's not really a choice, but I did get to do, uh, I did country on the air there for, I think like two months on Sunday mornings. And I, I used the name skip church. <laughs> <laughs> because actually like sort of people I who'd listen that. to whisk in church yeah very good i like it very I was clever. Like, well, well, so, I, so i did do like <laughs> like two months of fucking boot scoot and boogie and garth brooks and all that shit it was like oh, i didn't God kill God. myself live on the air it was, it was an untenable era of country yeah, music it. um <laughs> it was rough it was rough yeah. so then from there uh, yeah. they shipped me out to la and then it was you know i was the night i was the night jock on y107 for uh, a year right. and a half and then nice. that ended because that's what happens in radio right and then you moved to what serious no first so that was so f after i went from there i got hired by mark goodman who is the old vj from mtv hmm. on an internet edu an internet entertainment portal as they were called called soundbreak that blew okay. through ninety million dollars in a year and a half, Jesus. and uh, <coughs> was the coolest fucking place I've ever worked. Uh, because when you're spending at that level, we had a blimp. Oh, sweet! Wow. <laughs> Literally had a blimp. Um, it was incredible. So the, the first day that we were on the air, on the air. Um, by the way, our broadcast was a window that would come up that was broadcasting stereo music it had a chat room it had a video window and oh. it was all on dial-up wow wow okay well, for anyone get like that CSL, yeah. it was like dial-up or t1 lines were like the two choices t1 yeah. was what people had in businesses nobody in their house had a fucking t1 line but right. it was we had 15 chat moderators 24 hours a day it was it was wow. absolutely amazing and on the first day that it. we were on the air this is kind of cool on the first day that we were on the air all of the original vjs gathered in the on-air studio and handed the keys to pop culture to us nice nice <laughs> very nice which is very cool was really cool but at the same point i was like you know that this is going to fail right because you can't do that you can't announce that you're going to change the world you just have to change the world like the yeah, minute you right. say you're going to change the world you're not going to get to change scale. the world exactly. it's <laughs> over <laughs> it's over you just over. signed your death warrant everybody and we uh we literally burnt through $90 million in a year and a half. And it, but it was incredible. Our studios were on the, the building that's right opposite Tower Records on Sunset. We were on the top floor. Our on-air oh, yeah. studios looked out over the whole of LA out to Catalina. It was the- That's beautiful. Everyone who was there, the greatest job they've ever had, except for the thing that I get to do now, which I think is the greatest job I've ever had. But at the time, it was just bananas. It was, it was a three-hour workday for seventy-five thousand dollars a year in nineteen ninety-nine. Wow! Oh, great! You know, like, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I went in for the meeting, and they were like, "So, just so you know, we're going to start you guys low on the pay. It's going to be about seventy-five k a year." And I was like, "I don't even know what to do with all of that money. I think I have to develop a coke habit." <laughs> I'm making like thirty-five thousand dollars a year at Y one hundred and seven at that point, so I was like, "This is double the pay, gentlemen, and a blimp I might." dad <laughs> it was actually the blimp oh, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so that was sound break and then that you know obviously that couldn't last I mean, no. how, does, how does that <laughs> right. possibly sustain at those levels i was like are these back rubs and massages i mean literally massages meals the whole nine yards i remember one of the moments when we knew we were in trouble was the uh the ceo would have these like she, her name was lisa something other she was fantastic We'd have these like meetings where we'd all be in the lobby of the building, and so she, uh, at the end of one of the meetings, she uh, she had this guy. She was like, "Henry, stand up!" So Henry stood up, and she was like, "This is Henry, everybody." And Henry's job is that he's the concierge, and me being okay. like the dude that likes to cause trouble, I like put my hand up, and I was like, "Hey," she's like, "Christian," and I'm like, "What? What is the concierge?" 
she was like, this is when web van exists. I don't know if you guys remember what web van was. Web van was like, uh. web van was sort of the, the, the precursor to Instacart. Okay. So you could have, you know, so don't forget cell phones don't really exist yet. No. no. Right. Right. Like we have them, but they're not where we're at now with these fucking things. So it was so archaic. So, um, job was to do whatever we wanted so i treated henry like my bitch and i would <laughs> while i was on while i was on the air i'd send him to koreatown to buy me deep fried fucking crickets and then bring them back so i could eat them live on the air i'd send him to get my car washed to pick up my dry cleaning it was extraordinary i was like this guy's fucking job is hellacious and then hey, as they asked him i turned to my buddy webb who's the one that had convinced them to get a blimp and we looked at each other and we were like, yeah, man, we better start saving this fucking money because I tell you what, this doesn't, this doesn't last, especially if we burn Henry out as quickly as possible. <laughs> crickets, Henry, crickets. Um, <clears throat> that place went out of business, shockingly. And, <laughs> uh, and I just enough, sort of, yeah. I farted around in LA for a little bit and I had gone to school originally to be a set designer and a, and a, and a lighting guy. So a bunch okay. of my friends had transitioned into music videos. Yeah. So right. I got to I hit them up and I was like, yeah, man, I kind of need work. And they were like, come and do art department. So I went into the art department on music videos and I ended up working on the Hey Ya video nice. uh, cool. with Outcast, which was sick. Sick. And the crazy <laughs> thing about that video was that we weren't allowed to hear the song. Like the only what? person who heard it was the director of the art department. Yeah. And we weren't allowed to hear it because obviously this is like back in the day when like leaks change everything. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, the yeah. first right. time we heard that song was the first playback at that video. And wow. we all looked at each other and we're like, holy shit, this wow. is going to be a worldwide smash. And yeah. it's the uh -huh. only music video of it. Do you remember what the video was? Yeah, it was them. Not particularly, it, it was them playing in. Uh, um, it was like a fake kind of TV show, wasn't it? Almost. Um, yeah, and Andre played it was all like a of kind the of film studio. Of the band. That's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it was yeah. Telecrane, so the crane did the same motions each time, and then he would just play each member of the band. That's right. And yeah. when, when okay. he came out playing like as each member of the band, the director would had this. Mic, he was one of these directors who likes to fucking direct with a microphone. He would do this right. big announcement and be like, on base, ladies and gentlemen. And then Andre would come out in like a new outfit, blah, 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 yeah. blah. And uh, I actually got my, <laughs> my housemate got to show, they came to the art department. They were like, yo, does anybody here know how to play any instruments? And nobody did. And they're like, well, we need like a bass player or a guitar player. So my buddy Leo had just moved to LA and he got to sit and show Andre where to put his fingers on the fretboard because Andre didn't want to look like he didn't know what he was doing. So he showed yeah, him sure. how to play the song on the fretboard. So it's the only video where I've like, you listen to the song 9,000 times over the 14 hours or whatever it was, because it was very long days. Um, right. And it's the only music video I've ever worked on where you were not tired of the song at the end of the day. Yeah, wow. You were nice. still listening to it in your head. You were still singing it the next morning. And it was just, you know, like, it was bonkers. Mm -hmm. Knowing that we were working on something that was just going to be a worldwide smash was really, really cool. Yeah, so I did that absolutely. for a little bit. And then that kind of burnt me out. And then um, I started doing construction. Because I was just like, I don't know what to do next. Like, I don't really know. And so then my, the the only program director that I've ever worked for who I really, you know, think like really appreciated my talent was the first one a guy by the name of Steve Blatter. And he left our radio station and then became the head of programming for Sirius. Mm -hmm. And I sent him okay. an email and was like, Hey man, I need a, uh, I need a gig. I want to get back into doing something. And I'd found that they were based at a studio called swing house mm -hmm. in Hollywood, which was just down the street. And he was like, right. go and talk to Will Pendarvis. You got a job. And then I started at Sirius. And then I was there for eight years mm -hmm. doing, oh, working nice. at the, working at the Kaiser Permanente of radio. <laughs> That's quite a nice way to put it. Yeah, yeah you can leave that in. It doesn't need to be edited out. I'll sign off on that there, Tobes. Uh -huh. All right, thank you, sir. <laughs> So I did that Perfect. for eight years and then I left right. there and that was where the sort of the nexus of the thing that I do now had started. And then that was, you know, the, my 
launching pad to trying to get this thing done was the yeah. Well, let's call talk about friend. that right now. Sure. Let's talk about like I like I found you on the sessions IG live on on uh, Instagram, and uh, I was blown away. My buddy Trevor Cole said, "Hey man, you got to check this guy out." Good old Trev. And I man did. feelings. Man feelings. Love yep. that guy. I'll give him a nice shout out. Thanks, Trevor. And, Best uh, I love that man. in Los Angeles. If you're looking for having guitars set up or dealt with, he's your guy. That's absolutely correct. Perfect. Right. Yep. So then, so how'd you start isolating vocal tracks and, and, and doing all that? Well, did you, when, so I had, uh, I skipped a bit where I also ended up producing a bunch of records and mixing a bunch of records for myself and for people. And then I ended up, there was a band that I worked on that had been done in my bedroom that got on the radio that was on Island. And when you were in the, you know, working in studios in that like mid 2000s, were people trading the files at that point? Were you aware of that? Yes. Yeah, that was what was going on, right? It's like you'd sit right. down and everybody would leave, and like the engineer would look at you and be like, "All right, dude, I got like three Led Zeppelin, two Beatles, and a Stevie Wonder," and you'd be like, "All right, dude, I got the Cars, I right. got some, I got three Fleetwood Mac you don't have, and uh, two Beatles," <laughs> and you'd trade them, and gradually over time, you could build a pretty good library of them. So exactly. I had, I'd accumulated a pretty solid library at that point, and. Okay. Um, we started doing just vocals on Sirius, but I knew that there was another level to it. Yeah. And so when I left Sirius, I called a friend of mine who was on a radio station called The Sound here in Los Angeles yeah. and okay. uh, 103.1. And he was okay. on the air with a guy by the name of Mark Thompson from Mark and Brian. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I hit him up and I was like, hey, man, I'm, I, I had this segment on Sirius and I think that there's a better way to do it. And I really think that your that Mark Thompson will lose his fucking mind if I do this. So I will give this to Mark Thompson for forever. Is that sight unseen? He didn't even know what I was doing. Uh, the guy Andy just hit him up and was like, "You should have my friend come in and do this." So I literally walked in with Mark Thompson, having no idea what I was about to do. I said to him, "I was like, who is Mark's favorite artist?" And he said, "Marvin Gaye." And I was like, "Dude, I." got this got it. one of the things yeah. i traded for yeah. three fleetwood mac and a beatles was heard it through the grapevine <laughs> so i was like <laughs> one of the best deals i've ever brokered i might add so i uh so I, I i i was like okay i got this so i sat down and flipped open my laptop and proceeded to go through heard it through the grapevine and mark was sitting right next to me and his jaw was open the entire time and when he tells a story he was like yeah he's like you walked in and it was me so immediately you're like, oh, what is this going to be? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, this can go a can number of ways. You. Most of yeah, most of them don't end well. You know what I'm saying? In your brain. <laughs> right. You right. saw the index card. Which is oh, what perfect. Each song is like each song gets its index card, which is the title, and then over here you have the producer and you have relevant information: album, title, band, yeah. date. And then here is cool. the players and then a little bit of autobiographical information. Yeah. And he said the minute he saw me pull the index card out, he was like, oh, we're going to be fine. This guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. And then I did uh, heard it through the grapevine and it was like 25 minutes. And he looked at me and he was like, you're coming back as often as possible. And that was the start. And then they had me in, I think it was like every two weeks for a while. And then eventually yeah. offered me like a full time job there, uh, which was a terrible choice. Uh, but one of the things that was nice about it was that it allowed me when I started to think about doing it as a live show, yeah. um, I literally rented swing house at the new location, had the radio station pay for it. And then I just invited 150 listeners and said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but come and yeah. check it out. I know that what we're going to do is sit and go through a bunch of songs mm -hmm. bits, right? but I yeah. don't know what this is going to be like. And then I did it and it was the coolest thing, the coolest feeling I'd ever had doing anything to do with music because it was all the things that I get to do, which is like, I, I love to get people to listen. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I love to, obviously I enjoy talking. Uh, I love to make people <laughs> laugh and I love people. I love watching people be surprised by something that they thought that they wouldn't be surprised by yeah yeah right yeah i, I can imagine that i can imagine you know that. that's awesome 
<clears throat> and it's a really great experience because the thing is that ultimately, except when I, you know, like I'll do like a Pantera song or something as the opening act, most of the material that I do is songs that people are fully aware of. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, they come in with the expectation of like, Meh. and then they're like, Meh. <laughs> two different facial expressions and noises are made you know yeah, and it's yeah, really rewarding right. it's a really yeah. rewarding experience and yeah, that was I've it like both of I, those faces both yeah. of them i mean yeah. you know yeah. and a at few the same others. time sometimes uh, that's right <laughs> <laughs> out of both sides and that was it like when i finished that first show you know, i was like this is all i want to do and whatever i need to do to support it and then i was on the sound and it, i could kind of see the writing on the wall that things weren't going to end well there yeah. Uh, so I hit up my buddy at KLOS and I was like, Hey man, I'd really like to bring this over to you guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, because one of the problems for me at this, there was a number of problems for me at the sound, but one of them was that I was only allowed to do classic rock songs. Right. Ah, okay. And uh, you know, I like everything. I, mm-hmm. I don't have, you know, I don't have a musical bias and I wanted to yeah. show people songs that surprised them like call me maybe, or, you know, yeah, yeah. Katy right. Perry or you name it. But it keeps it interesting for you. So as well, one of I the rules, it. absolutely. Because that's what my library reflects. Like I don't have a ghetto. I don't look at it yeah. and be like, I'm never going to do that. You know? So yeah. I, I hit, when I hit up my buddy over at KLOS, I said, you know, like the one thing is I want to be able to do whatever music I want to be able you know, whatever I want to do. And, right. you know, he would, he agreed was like, yeah, dude, you should absolutely do that because that's part of the coolness of the bit is to, you know, blow exactly. people's minds with call me. Maybe, I mean, call me maybe is my favorite one to do from that perspective because it's yeah. really shockingly genius. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you know, when people don't, when you can contextualize for people, how hard it is to make a piece of music that will resonate no matter language, no yeah. matter country of origin, no matter yeah, totally. cultural, it's really, really difficult to do that. Yeah, well, sure. um, totally. I mean, you know, there's like sort of basically a reason uh, why that song has sold millions of copies throughout throughout the entire world. You know, kind of, you know, it actually just kind of mm-hmm. speaks to someone, you know, it, you know, it actually just speaks to people. It does is the the melody makes you feel happy and the yeah, tempo is right. perfectly set for you to be able to dance to it yeah doesn't really matter like you know i've got a feeling that tonight to put that on anywhere yeah exactly <clears throat> anywhere and watch that crowd go fucking ballistic they don't care uh-huh. it's because it's like that's that song is so brilliant because it's literally about the thing that it's about making yeah. you do the thing that the song is about the song is telling you i've got do, a yeah. feeling that tonight's going to be the best night ever and here's the song to sing as you celebrate the thought that tonight's going to be the best song ever or the best night ever and then we're going to make it the best night ever because you're going to be so stoked at the end of this song that your endorphins are going to be crazy your synapses and all that shit oxytocin and you're going to have an amazing night period <laughs> period <laughs> So it's really fun for me to be able to, you know, show people that stuff where it's like things that they don't expect. That's probably the one that I get more feedback other than Hollywood Nights. I think that's the one that surprises more people than anything else is just to call me maybe it's so brilliant. And of course, it's mixed by fucking what's his name from Skinny Puppy, which is just bonkers. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, like I play when I do it, I play Tin Omen from Skinny Puppy's Rabies album. And I'm like, this dude who was in this band mixed this song and similar to toby's experience with with lars on that record they spent like four hours on the kick drum nice because they wanted that kick to to do exactly yeah. and then when you listen to it now you're like holy shit this kick drum is amazing like how did they right. even do that exactly. so that's the fun of it for me is to get people to really it's easy to show people that the beatles are amazing yeah yeah right <laughs> You know, like, show them that's themselves. the easiest job in the world. Yeah. Right? right. They already know when they walk in through the door. But to show them things that, you know, are songs that they've either derided or don't know if I'm like showing people how amazing Pantera are is, you know, yeah. is a is a huge thrill. Oh, for you sure. I, I mean getting to show people, Toby, how fucking sick those bass lines are on on, you know, the Justice for All record is is like what a gift for people to be able to find, especially hardcore Metallica fans. Mm-hmm. That's right. To get to sit there and be like, 
that was going on the whole time? And you're like, yeah, uh, right. like the, the yeah. dude wasn't brought in because he looked pretty. <laughs> <laughs> you know they weren't like it was tall that. and hair uh, yeah, right. because he was an amazing bass player and we've never really known that it's such yeah. a robbery for jason to be honest with you yeah yeah you know and crafted those parts are crafted so well exactly. so well <laughs> Yep. Like the, you know, like the, I can't wait to do that session with you live because the thought of like sitting there and and honing those parts—it's like the McCartney thing of sitting there and him honing the performances and the parts and the lines that whole time. You can hear exactly. it in the McCartney shit. Yeah, right. The only way you get to hear it in the Jason stuff is when you solo it. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. So to get to you know, that's one of the things that I really love doing is getting the people like Toby who were there for that experience to be able to tell people what that experience was like yeah. because you were right. there for it like what a yeah. gift amazing totally. and i recorded it all <laughs> that's what i'm saying like you sat there in those yeah. rooms with just you and him yep. same thing with lars yep same you know, shit crafting those drum parts that bass drum on one is fucking ridiculous uh-huh <laughs> woof, 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 woof. that woof. whole thing oh yeah <laughs> stupid Stupid. Give you a little shaky in your ears. Hundred <laughs> percent, totally. Um, has anyone ever like kind of objected to, to, um, to you kind of processing their tracks? Yes, I had uh, I had one specific artist who wasn't into it, and then which I can understand. You know, I mean, there's especially if you don't know me, you don't know what yeah. that thing's going to be like. Like one of the one of the greatest compliments that I've. <laughs> I had a, a four hour conversation with Jimmy Jam one night, which is a short conversation with Jimmy, I might add. That's a quickie. And uh, <laughs> he was uh, saying that there was another guy in England, I think, doing the same sort of bit. And one of his friends had hit him up and was like, yo, this guy's, you know, check it out. So he listened. And halfway through, the guy started to critique the bridge. And was like, okay. I don't think I would have made that choice. I would have gone to a C sharp instead of a. And Jimmy Jam's like, motherfucker, I'm in the fucking, I'm in the songwriters' hall of fame, and you're doing a podcast about my music, <laughs> and you're telling me that I made the incorrect choices, you know? And he was like, you know, because he had originally said like this conversation was like three and a half hours long into it, and he he suddenly says, I got to be honest with you, I don't really sign off on what you're doing, and I was like, what? It was like, you shouldn't have access to this stuff. And I was like, no, you're absolutely right. And especially I shouldn't have access to it if he doesn't. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, like if the original (laughs) creators don't have access to it, then some dick sitting in his room, sitting on the internet, should not have access to it. (laughs) But he said, if there's anyone who should have access to it and does what he's doing, it should be you because you never critique. It's never a discussion of choices. It's never, was this the right thing to do? I wouldn't have done this as a, pre- and there are plenty of things I'm like, nah, I'm not so sure if I would, but I would never say that. That's not my job. No, no. Right, so right. you don't know what I'm doing. And you suddenly hear that some guy's going to pull out songs apart and, you know, go through this tracks. You're like, well, fuck him. Why does, yeah. you know, so this particular artist was like, yeah, I don't really want him to do that. And then their manager said, well, if you check it out, it's actually all love. And he's, going to show people that you're brilliant and that your choices yeah. are brilliant and that the music that you've made, you know, it's five individual stories of brilliance. Mm-hmm. And right. at the end, I was really, I was actually, it was really nice because at the end of the day, this person turned around and was like, okay, yeah, I think that's great. And I was supposed to do it live with them. And then unfortunately it fell to pieces pre COVID. Um, yeah. okay. But it would have been really great. And it's always a real, you know, when I hear that stuff, when I sit with people, and at the end of it, like Linda Perry was, it's, it was such a beautiful hour that we spent at NAMM when yeah. they, when the creators look at me and are like, this was a really rewarding, beautiful experience. There's nothing better than that. No, you not know, at all. Because not at all. Exactly. it's such a special way to show people. It gives, it's almost like what it does is it gives the artists or the producers or the engineers or whoever permission to kind of think that they're a badass <laughs> because nobody, you know, like nobody ever wants to do that. Like it's, you know, you wouldn't be like, Hey, by the way, my fucking work on one is really kind of extraordinary. I don't know if you guys have heard the bass drum, but it goes like wolf, wolf right after each hit. And it's fucking spectacular. <laughs> Everyone would be like, Toby writes a dick. 
He was like <laughs> right. blowing himself up the other day on this podcast about how amazing his choices are. But if you get this guy to look at you and be like, by the way, all of your choices are amazing, he gets to be like, well, thanks, man. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it allows you to be rewarded for your art, which is, you right. know, at the end of right. the day, the artists are one thing. The producers and the engineers and the mixers are the people who get no love. Yeah. You know, right. and in exactly. certain cases, it's the artists who get no love. Like I got a, um, I got a message from Clyde Stubblefield's daughter uh, after I did James Brown, and she was like, "Thank you so much for putting the shine on my dad," because people know about that drum break, but they don't know about the rest of his work. They don't know about the other eleven minutes of that fucking song where that dude just sits there and does he motors. Yep, exactly. He motors for 11 minutes. And he just never drifts, never stops, never yep. fucking miss hits, nothing. And she was like, the fact that you're showing all of those dudes for not in the same, because it's different than a documentary, right? Where you see the pictures and you hear the story, you still don't get to hear their performances. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And at the end of the day, right. a documentary is about, is dancing about architecture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. But getting to hear the performance, you get to hear the person. Mm -hmm. And getting to show, story. it's a whole other thing, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, totally, the, yeah. I, you know, I, I go back to the Metallica experience with you. Like, I had genuinely judged Lars because I had heard that he didn't play all the way through. And I was like, well, that's kind of dick, especially as a drummer. But then to hear that the reason he didn't play all the way through is because he wanted to craft every single moment and make sure that every single thing was perfect and that every yep. i was like holy shit that's an artisan all of a sudden mm -hmm. right you know, exactly. that's not a lazy prima donna which i had thought <laughs> he was prior that's like no, dude, <laughs> right. that's a guy who gave a fuck at a level that uh, was exactly. like 16 seconds of audio 48 seconds of audio in 16 hours like that's crazy right, so exactly that's why you know getting to do it this way you know, except for that one guy, most of the artists are all of the artists have been really grateful for it because it tells the story of who they are and why they do what they did in a very specific way that then gets to show genuinely how brilliant they were. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, and totally. you have a great way of doing it, too, you know, and I think that's that's half of the battle, because like you said, the guy in England, you know. He didn't do it as well, and he had some critique, and it's not his place. Like, it's not you your don't place. Do that, any of that shit. No, no, totally. Especially so if the you song's a wish fucking list? smash. <laughs> like, right. You know, you're like, it's like a, that Janet Jackson's control should have had a bridge in it. And you're like, um, right. I'm, 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 if, I'm not sure that that's true. Huh. It seems to have been a massive <laughs> smash without the bridge, so maybe it didn't need a bridge after all. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? But thank you. Yeah, I, I heard, heard that the... I think that the thing is is that at the end of the day i'm a fan right exactly i'm not it a shows. documentarian i'm not a, you know i'm not a journalist i'm just the dude who loves music and loves these songs and loves these these characters every you're a fucking character dude mm -hmm. right look at you you're a character you I should know. have a fucking you should have a funk i want i want a funko right now like <laughs> what up you know, up. so like you know and, and as we know everybody in in music is a character that's right yeah that's right everybody so, you know like all of those people that you meet and they all have stories and they all have perspectives and and those ultimately at the end of the day i think should be heard agreed I it's totally, sad that totally they don't agreed. get heard yeah very much so so do you have a wish list of songs that uh you know you'd like to do in the future and don't have your paws on quite yet or the entire uh phil collins uh discography up till but seriously um and then okay. um why not but Africa, seriously but seriously oh. i love but seriously after that i it's it stops speaking to me in the same way mm -hmm. um okay. but yeah. you know that's just what happens with bands and artists uh sure there's something really i mean my thing is is Hello, I must be going. I think is his. That's the peak of the, the you know, The no jacket required is like holy fuck. I mean, it's just like hit, 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 hit. It's like a great. It's like oh yeah. You know, it's like Def Leppard's Hysteria. It's a greatest hits collection that isn't a greatest hits collection. <laughs> exactly. You know? But to me, but hello, I must be going. It's like such a beautiful scope of work. Um, so I would love to have 
at that record, if I could have every everything off of there, um, except for you can't hurry love. I don't know. Um, but the <laughs> other one, if there was a single song, it would be uh, Africa from Toto. Ooh, okay. Nice. Good call. And I the love reason those boys. being that not only is it an amazing song, but it, it sits in such a unique place in culture to be able to show people the machinery of why that song sits at that place in culture is yeah. a really cool look into like a TARDIS of a song. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because like, why? Why was it right. that song? Right, why exactly. Does that song do what it does to every single audience that hears it, no matter where they are. Yeah. yeah. You know? And it's the least Afrocentric song ever. I mean, like, it's, it's really, you know, like, I don't, you know, this, I think there was like a story like Steve Lukather when, when David Page presented the song was like, what the fuck are you talking about? You've never even been to Africa, you know? And like, all the, you know, there's like a number of mistakes, Africa, geography in there or whatever, but it just, the melody, the playing, like, how the fuck did it do what it does? Because it's not yeah. the same as a Rick Roll, right? A Rick Roll is that song is beautiful and works as a Rick roll, but that was because there was a gimmick to begin with. There was no gimmick with Africa. Africa is like yeah. a genuine song That's that right. doesn't, you know, not that not, and I don't mean that the Rick Astley's song was a gimmick, but the, the way it became a Rick roll and became culturally omnipresent was the gimmick, which was to yeah, Rick yeah. roll people. Right. Right. Africa just suddenly was Africa. Yeah. Yep. You know, Something to be and, said about about how it speaks to people, oh, totally. right? And like you to know? be able to show people what the machinery of that beat and those the way the melodies play against each other and the genius of all of those pieces would be a really amazing, amazing session to get to do. Especially if I could do it with David Page, which would really be my yeah, dream. Oh, wow, you know, because yeah, he that's, he wrote that thing, so there's his DNA is in it. Yep. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Whereas the other guys like like Steve and you know, unfortunately Picaro is like you could probably Steve Picaro I could do it with, but the writer of it, I think, especially to show also to show appreciation to him, because that's part of it. It's like I really love being able to sit with people and as I said, through this context, celebrate them and their brilliance. Right. You know, exactly. and I would hope that that would be a really special experience for the people that get to, uh, you know, I want to get to the point where people are like, so uh, what is it about my music that you don't like, that you haven't done one of my songs yet? And I'll be like, well, Mick Fleetwood, we'll just get you on the next one. It's not a problem. Come on through, chap. We'll do the, we'll do the chain. It's going to be great. Don't worry. I love you, man. It's all, it's all love, baby. It's all love, you know, like. I, I kind of want to get to the point. There's a, there's a line a of cool people banana. that are bummed I haven't done their music yet is where yeah. I want to get to. Nice. Right. Okay. Nice. Well, that's fucking awesome. It's a real I'm, gift. It is a gift. How would you feel about dissecting a song by a band like, say, Seager Ross, who I absolutely adore Seager Ross, but they write quite a few of their songs that are actually in their own kind of made-up language, which is Hopelandic, and they encourage fans to have their own interpretation of the lyrics. Would you ever like sort of attempt to do something by them? Yeah, I mean, it's like the same thing with the with the Cocteau Twins, right? Yeah, Where you have much. Elizabeth Fraser sort of like making up her own language yeah. and bec like becoming an instrument. Um, yeah. And to me, that's 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 really interesting as well because I think the Sugar Rose thing goes even a step further. Isn't it that they pick one of the fans' lyrics to become the official lyric of the song? Like, I they thought actually it was even in the deeper past. where, like... They actually they kind of have done, yeah. Right? Like, Yonzi yeah. and the guys yeah. actually, like, voted off on, like, this is what the song... Like, that would be amazing yeah. to be able to yeah. show people... Because that's like such a singular relationship with your fans. Oh, massively. That's sure. such yeah, a massively. unique approach to, to, to like, to suddenly recontextualize phonetics to yeah. have it now mean a thing that Yonzi didn't even mean to have it mean. Like, it's fucking yeah. meta as fuck. Like, there's so much yeah, yeah. going on there. It gives you, like, an ice cream headache when you really think about it. <laughs> but, you know, they're also incredible musicians. Yeah, they yeah. are incredible musicians. Incredible yeah. musicians. Um, yeah. You know, there's actually so, yeah, I would love to do that. I would love to do a, a, a you know, a, 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 anything like that. I mean, the one thing that I wouldn't 
try to do is I wouldn't try to do a foreign language that I was unaware of. I can get away with phonetics, but I can't, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't get away with doing a soda stereo song because I would feel that I couldn't do it the justice that it deserves because the emotional yeah. component is missing because I don't speak that language. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. I would prefer that that would be done by somebody, you know, like my goal would be to have like a franchise where there's a French <laughs> version of me and a, a, you know, a Latin American version of me and a German version of me. And they're all the over Welsh, the place. They all have to shave their heads, the Welsh wear version of glasses yeah. and get over. We'll have a uniform, of course, obviously <laughs> it'll be like, it'll be like the Wendy's With the of music. With, the, with their own Funko. With their own Funkos, yes, you know? yes. Um, <laughs> or maybe, you know, everyone has to have a Funko of me that just, like, sits there and judges them the whole time. Like, they know the boss is in, you know? Like, ah, the bald guy's right. looking at me. Um, but, yeah, that would be the goal, would be to, to find people all over the place who have the same level of passion and knowledge about mm. their specific, you know, language, country of origin, so that they can contextualize the music in a way that I couldn't if I was. Like, yeah. I don't know the effect that Soda Stereo have on Latin American music other than anecdotally. Yeah, 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 right. You know, and I would rather it be first person instead of third person. Oh, of course. Totally. You know, because that's effective. what the music is doing, is it's hitting people first person. Right. Yeah. Well, that's you what know? music does, isn't it? Yep. So can you tell us about some of the more emotional sessions that might have come up? Um, yeah, I mean, we've had some really, especially the IG live versions have been, you know, <laughs> there's a great screen grab of me just being like the day that Niall <laughs> Rogers showed up in a chic one and he was like, what's going on? And I was like, holy shit. Chic. <laughs> <laughs> Niall Rogers in the chat. Um, right. It's been, you know, there's been. Uh, a few of the Instagram versions, the one with the the, the sort of one in the, the the hallowed halls of the of the greatest hits was the was the Prince one with Wendy, which was an extraordinary three and a half hours. Um, the live ones that I've done, the one with STP, was really profound because in playing the vocal to them, I hadn't realized until they told me live on the air in quotes that they'd never been allowed to hear Scott sing a cappella before. Wow. And this was like oh, on wow. the 25th anniversary re-release of Core, right. their first record. Yeah, yeah. And we had just right. done Plush and uh, Dean was a little bit emotional and was like, I need just a brief moment to kind of calibrate or recalibrate. And when he came back, he was like, you know, you should probably know that we've never heard scott that way before because yeah. when they tracked with wow. him they would get kicked out of the studio and right, they would right. go smoke cigarettes play pool get some chinese food whatever they needed to do and scp solely eats chinese food um and uh <laughs> they you know brendan o'brien and scott would do the vocal they would comp it together taking a number of uh -huh. takes and you know making them into one and then brendan yep. o'brien is the kind of producer that mixes as he goes and the record sort of comes together in real time and when the band were invited, the other three of the band were invited back into the studio, it was to hear a finished song. Mm -hmm. So they had never heard him. And it, that one is particularly profound because it's all of the mouth noises and him coughing and sort of shuffling and sort of trying to hit the note beforehand to give himself the warm up note was all yeah. there. So, you know, for them, it was a, you know, they hugged me afterwards and Rob gave me this huge hug and was, was like, this was a, this was a profound day for this band. Wow. Um, which, you know, as somebody, you know, as, as somebody, I hadn't actually even thought about that until that moment. That was the first time that I had a band react in that way. And I suddenly realized that there was, there was something really profound about this experience linda perry was the same way you know at the end of our session she looked at me and she was like this is the first time in my career i've ever allowed myself to look back yeah wow you know and you know and she's like and then i can look at this 19 year old girl and tell her that you know stick with your guns man <laughs> you're right <laughs> yeah, yeah and that's right. you know yeah. the fight is going to be awful and the struggle is going to be inestimable but at the end of the day you know what you're doing and you're going to be okay yeah which you, you could, I would never in a million years have thought that that was a possibility. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, 
Um, so that's really beautiful. And as I say, that's part and parcel of that thing I was talking about where the bands get, the artists get permission to honestly look at themselves because it's not self grandizing. It's me grandizing and them just getting to receive it and to be able to sit in it and hear themselves and be like, yeah, no, we kind of are badasses. (laughs) <laughs> like, you know, like, this, this song really is kind of badass and there's four other people in this band or three other people in this band and they were all fucking badasses you know right. and that's the great thing about the songs is that if it's five players it's five stories and then there's yeah. an engineer who has a story and then there's a producer who has a story so there's seven stories right. in that song yeah yeah that's right. you know it's like your story of you and and of you and lars working together is similar but completely different to lars's story of you and lars working together Right, right, exactly. You know, and that that experience of getting people to be surprised by their, like, that was not what Linda Perry thought was going to happen. That is not what STP thought were going to happen when they sat down to do that right. thing. They were just, you know, like, the STP didn't even know. They were like, what are we doing next? And I was like, oh, I have the stems from Plush, and we're going to go to them. And they're like, oh, cool. Same thing with Linda. She was like, what are we doing? I'm like, I have What's Up. And she was like, oh, that sounds fun. And then to have right, it be okay. this journey through the song right through the song and through their own memory like my like I, I really wish there was a way that i could like plug a cable into their head so that we could actually see what they're seeing as they yeah. hear the uh-huh. song well you Elon know musk's got that coming up pretty quick i hear neural nets <laughs> sure on its way yeah, everybody and it'll be yeah, that's but right like, you know i have a <laughs> photo of that. the stp if you go on my website and watch the epk there's actually a screen grab of the photo of the three of them all sitting there. Robert's got his hand over his headphones and his eyes are closed. Dean is like slumped down and Eric is sitting there right next to me and they're all closed eyed. And you can see that there is, each of them is having a very different, equally profound experience at the same time. And it was really, it was, it was beautiful to be part of. And I I was, I was, grateful for the generosity of the band to be willing to sit in that discomfort mm-hmm. all the way yeah. through yeah. because that has to be complicated yeah totally you oh, know it's totally. not like cliff passing away in metallica where it's like this horrible accident it's like you watched somebody disintegrate and you fought yeah. for them to not disintegrate and you fought for them to keep the band going and they're the front guy yep what do you do without your lead singer? Like the only band that's ever fully recovered from the death of their lead singer is Joy Division into New Order. Yeah, very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, name another one. You can't change their band name and change everything about themselves. There isn't. There, there isn't right. one that I yeah. know of in in yeah. Western music. There may be in, yeah. in genres I'm aware unaware of, but in Western music, New Order into Joy Division into New Order is the only time that that has functioned. Yeah, I agree. where the success yeah, totally. was greater than the original band, where the thing yeah. goes on to become so much bigger than they'd even understood that it could have been originally. Yeah, totally. right. So, totally. you know, to watch these three men in their now you know fifties at that point, looking back on themselves as young 21, 23 year olds, and just being like, "What is that story?" So when they said right. that it was cathartic, like, "Holy fuck!" I provided a cathartic moment for stp by simply going through the stems of there was a great moment because this is another thing i don't have you ever had this toby i didn't realize that this happened so eric is a huge john bonham fan have you ever had a drummer in a band that you've worked with come to you and say hey listen when everyone else is fucked off after this record's mixed can we just solo all my drums so i can hear what i sound like post mix oh yeah who's done that and I've, and I've had them ask me for stems of themselves. So that's that, amazing. Quote, unquote, so, I can learn the parts. Oh, oh no, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something really beautiful about that because they never, you know, like you don't get to hear yourself post mix, right? So yeah, never. Eric had, Eric had never heard himself post mix. So he sits okay. there and he's getting to hear himself like fucking boom. And he's a huge Bonham fan. And that song right. starts with da 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 which is like Bonham by the numbers. And it's a uh-huh. huge like Brendan O'Brien Bonham sound. And he looks at right. me, he's got the headphones on, he goes, 
oh man, is that is that too bottom, dude? And I was like, no, 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 it's just the right amount of bottom. It's just the right there. amount of bottom. <laughs> <laughs> just the right amount, you know? But I had never even thought about that, that like most drummers don't get to hear themselves post-mix, solo. Yeah. Yeah. They right, hear yeah. themselves in the mix, but the average person, the average drummer, does I would never think to go to the mixer and be like, hey, dude, can I just get my drum stem so I can hear how fucking amazing I sounded on this record? Can I be bottom? Right, off? right. They only ever hear themselves in that like post performance mix, which is never as cool as the post mix mix ever. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So yep. that was kind of cool, <laughs> you know, and getting guitarists getting to hear just their parts. Like I had a great moment with uh, with Robbie Krieger where I was doing L.A. Woman and it was him and Bruce Botnick. Oh, wow. And at the end of it, there's like this really cool guitar overdub at the end of it. And I, and I was like, hey, Krieger, like this is my favorite moment in the whole song. And uh, he looked at me and he was like, "What's that?" And I was like, "That's that's your that's your guitar overdub from the end of L.A. Woman." And he looks at Bruce Botnick and he's like, "We did overdubs on L.A. Woman." Like, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so Botnick, who has like a photographic memory, it would appear, is like, "Yeah, yeah." You came in the next day and we did like the castanets and some keyboards, and we, then you did that guitar overdub. And then he looks at me and he's like, and, and Krieger looks at me and he's like. Uh, can you play that a couple more times so I can just learn it real quick to show the band tomorrow night and practice? So he sat there <laughs> oh, wow. at NAMM with like 200 people watching and being like, this is fucking staged. There is no way in hell that we're watching <laughs> Robbie Krieger learn the guitar part from the end of L.A. Woman. He was like literally doing like the, the miming muscle memory of the chords to sure. do it. <laughs> Amazing. Yep. <laughs> so when that shit happens where people are like i didn't even remember that we did that or oh my god that's the you know like that lead is way cooler than i thought it was when i first played it is also right. amazing exactly. because those moments are like completely spontaneous and honest and real in the moment in a way that you know a staged performance would never allow themselves to be that open about it yeah that's right that's right and that's the beauty of the you know? show too yeah very, well it, thank you getting... i i I love that about it because, you know, it gives a chance of, for the musician to relearn their parts. <laughs> to know precisely what they were doing on things like, you know, I did a bunch of Blink-182. I did a bunch of Jimmy Eat World and Zach okay. from Jimmy Eat World was in there. And like a couple times, Zach was like, what the fuck is that? And he was like, that had to be a trombino moment. He's like, and to be honest, if you had known that was happening, I probably wouldn't have let that happen in the song. Like they were hearing stuff they didn't even know was in the track because – Trombino right. was like burying these little <coughs> secrets in the tracks that were, you know, off in the middle distance that you heard. And once you knew it, that was another cool thing is like once you hear these things, <coughs> suddenly you can't imagine. You're like, oh, you can't unhear it. But prior to it right. being pointed out, you had no idea that it was there. Yeah, exactly. And then exactly. and then you hear it and you're like, how could I not have known that that was there the entire time? <laughs> It's right. because your brain well, can only absorb what, like three things at a time, or whatever it is, right? Like your so ear you, can only. Has there any anybody ever caught like you know when if a if a outside party did an overdub on a song, and then the band didn't really know about it? Has there ever been any oh, of that kind of? No, you know? not that not that I've had yet, but I'm sure that's coming. Yeah. It's going to come up. <laughs> it's going to come up. You know, there's going to be a moment where it's like somebody's like, "Wait a minute, that does not sound like my Earl, my fucking Stingray bass. That sounds like a P bass, and I don't play a exactly." P bass. You got to have a a very uncomfortable moment where you're like, "Yikes!" <laughs> so who did play that bass? <laughs> like I know a couple of producers that retrack a lot of guitars on some songs that people get to hear on the radio that aren't the band playing the guitars, you know, like that that's, shit happens. That's Oof. right. So Super. haven't had that yet. Okay, cool. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> It'll come up sure soon. It's coming and I look forward to that moment. That's going to yeah, be on call. That's when I'll be like, good. well, you should just start texting people right now and try to find out what to get to. Let's get to the bottom of that in real time. <laughs> exactly. That'd be fun. You know, that'd be lots of fun. <laughs> Put them on speakerphone. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, let's see. How about if you tell us about your podcast, The Man vs. Radio? Yes. Man vs. Radio was a thing that I started because, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but radio is just, it's in, in poor condition. Uh, I've and, heard the you know, rumors, of, yeah. Yeah, rumors have, rumors have. 
Um, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, the, the consultants have unfortunately, you know, convinced everyone is that new music doesn't work. And that people need to, you know, be hammered with the same bullshit over and over again. And, you know, I think that that's true because unfortunately, most of the radio DJs that that I hear on the air are bigger fans of themselves than they are of the music that they're playing. Uh, You know, I I call it the Howard Sternization of music, where it's it's more about who I am in between the songs than the songs themselves. And the people that I heroes that I have in radio were people like John Peel, who you could listen to John Peel for two hours and like six fucking songs, but you didn't not want to listen to John Peel. Yeah. Totally. Right. You know, like I can't stand the fall, but I would listen yeah. to John Peel play seven fall songs in a row because he'd play the House Martins after that, and I'd be like, "Oh, now that's amazing! I'll listen <laughs> to that." <laughs> Hell so yeah! It just you know, like the 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 curation got fucked, and people weren't being introduced to to new music, and you know. The other thing for me that's a great sadness, and I'm sure that both of you have this experience, where there are songs from 10 years ago that nobody's ever heard that are amazing. Yeah, totally. So why the fuck isn't that song being played on the radio Mm -hmm. by a DJ who's passionate about it and said, you know, like I had this on Man vs. Radio, I had this thing called New Zealand New, which came from my parents moved to New Zealand. And one of the the amazing things they did is like Orwellian doublespeak in New Zealand is they import a lot of cars from Japan. And when they import okay. them from Japan to New Zealand, instead of calling them pre-owned or used, they're called New Zealand New. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I'm just like, you can't argue with that as a used car. No, it isn't. That's New Zealand New, mate. It's brand new here. Yeah. It's like, it's got 130,000 miles on it. Yeah, but they're not New Zealand miles. So therefore, That's right. <laughs> it's new here. So I did this thing on Man vs. Radio called New Zealand New, which is where I would play songs from 15 years ago that people hadn't heard. Yeah. And okay. it's an amazing song that you didn't get to hear. So why the fuck wouldn't that be a song that you'd be into? Yeah, totally. Right. Amen. Totally. It's just because it's <sighs> chronologically from 1992. Like, what the fuck does that, you know, so there's this entire this, this mindset yeah, no, of totally. radio that everything needs to be brand new, that all of the stuff had to be that was completely fake. It just, it should be good. Mm, totally right. yeah. it should be a yeah. great song totally that's it that's, that matters, that's the totally. only criteria oh t- that's totally. the only and, criteria and and as like and that's something that that i have always built the ethos of actually my show on that kind of firstly i've never played one song that i don't personally like i've always made a point of of basically building a set around music that i think is good and actually deserves to be heard that's that's the job uh, totally being a totally DJ. yeah like, to me, exactly. Be, to, exactly to me being a dj wasn't to sit and be like don't forget booger and the nudge you're going to be at the state farm and fucking 10th street and 19th <laughs> if you come and say the phrase that pays you'll get the possibility of a pair of tickets to see johnny and the dicks at the state fair on thursday <laughs> here's fucking you know here's uh, hotel california from like that's not being a fucking dj and no, that was like no, part no, of no, my no, no, that, you know that was my my genuine just such i was so disappointed that was one of the things that you know why steve bladder was such a beautiful program director at x107 and into y107 was that he genuinely gave me a lot of rope to hang myself with because <laughs> he knew that i could do the job yeah you know, right. I had a I had a fucking electronica mix show on on a Friday night at eleven o'clock, where you know, Uber Zone and dudes like that in nineteen ninety eight would come to the studio and do a full hour long set. Now the thing, the reason that that's important is that eleven to midnight is still a rated day part. Yeah, yeah, right. After midnight, the ratings don't matter until six in the morning, so you can fucking do anything, which is why yeah, most yeah. of the radio stations K Rock had their mix yeah. show on a Saturday night starting at 11 was because it didn't dig their ratings at all. Mm-hmm. Right. But because okay. I had a rate, because I had it at 11 o'clock, it was a rated day part, which meant that my playing of those songs would actually affect charts. Right. 
And I was uh, given that by my program director, which was an enormous gift. It made that yeah. show really, really powerful and nice. important and greatly appreciated by the electronical world yeah. because people would, you know, at midnight on a Friday, three quarters of your audience is either asleep in the bar or at the club. 11 right. o'clock, they're on their way. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally <laughs> different world, man. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. you know, like that was that for me was, you know, part of my my pain of radio is that it doesn't do the job that it was supposed to be doing anymore. Yeah. You know, and the algorithm mm -hmm. okay. doesn't do the fucking same just because you like one song that's 132 beats beats per minute that's in a major chord that's got a chick singing that's guitar driven with a little bit of an electronic a trip hop feel to it doesn't mean that I'm going to like every single fucking thing that fits into that same piece of Tupperware. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Totally. In fact, it's highly likely that I won't. Because yeah. <laughs> I'll just be like, right. that sounds a lot like sneaker pimps. Yeah. I'm not right. interested. Exactly. No, you know? Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'd rather hear this love from Pantera right out of sneaker pimps. Like, that's yeah. way more interesting to me. Oh, yeah. And, and the man. algorithm can't uh, do that. No. No, not at all. No, not, not at, at all. all. What, can't hear it. What, what does that is an educated, smart you know, interesting DJ who's basically just your brother's best friend who smoked weed and sat in the basement with you and was like, have you ever heard King Crimson? <laughs> right, exactly. And that's what DJ should be. They should be yeah. the stoned older brother's best friend. <laughs> yep. And, you know, that's not that's not what the gig was. The gig was now either a human fucking cart machine or a dude who was way more stoked about himself than he was about the music that he was playing. And that sucked. I hated yeah. that because I'm a music fan at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. I am. You most know, definitely. and yeah. you know, that's my greatest joy is to turn people onto new music and, and have them be like, oh shit, dude, that's my new favorite record. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. that's wow, awesome. Yep. Win-win. Yeah, win win. Totally. You know, like the amount of people who will will say something like, "I didn't really give a fuck about that band." Like, so many people didn't give a fuck about Jimmy at World because all they knew was the middle. And then yeah. when I started playing other things right. to them, and they then went and explored the other members, the other parts of that catalog, were like, "Dude, Clarity is a masterpiece." And I'm like, "I know. That's why I told you it was a masterpiece." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. But radio did has done such a disservice, and it's why it is the blacksmithing in media like there's a reason for that is that it hasn't taken care of it's it hasn't cared enough about itself agreed yeah you know agreed yep like i don't know one consultant who's ever been on the air right right well <laughs> like me walking up to red bull and being like i think i should be a driver I think I should be in an F1 car. I've never done it, but I've watched it a lot, and I'm pretty sure I've read some great books on it. And uh, I, I'm, how hard could that job be? <laughs> well, let's ask Max. <laughs> you'd, never, you'd never be like, oh, no, he's right. You know what? He's, he's right. Put Come him on. in the fucking car, guys. Put him Put in the car. On him. I think Here's the keys. Come on. Come on. Here's the keys. He's watched every season of, uh, of Need for Speed. So this guy, <laughs> he, he should be win. on here. Like, what is that? You've never been on the radio and I'm supposed to sit there and have you tell me how to do my fucking job as a DJ? Come on, man. Right. That's unbelievable. What a disservice well, to music. Amen. Amen. You know, great, great disservice to music. And it's, it's you know, the, and, and the thing that sucks about it the most is that the thing that radio does that podcasting can't do is that radio is the only media left other than my show where the audience and the host in quotes are living in the same time at the same place. Yeah. So it is a shared experience. Right. Yeah. Right. And there is something very important about that because that is community. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. You we know, need more like of that, obviously. Yeah. If it's three o'clock for me, it's three o'clock for you. If you're sitting, mm -hmm. you know, in traffic stuck and I'm in a studio stuck and we're both like, yeah, it's three o'clock. That sucks. Here's some music to help you get through that. Yeah. Right. Here's a story about something that might entertain you to help you get through that. That that's the job. Yeah, that's right. You know, yeah, the much. job was to be I like, you know, that's why you, you know, like one of the friends of mine who's in radio was like, dude, I, I can't believe that in 2021, it was the last year, it's like you've created appointment radio worldwide. Mm -hmm. 
because there's no archive. So if you don't tune in, I have people at, in fucking Thailand getting up at four in the morning. Right. That's amazing. Quite a, comp- quite a, quite a compliment to you, sir. Yeah, massively. Well, you know? thank you. I mean, I, I like to think that it's, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's 30% me, 70% the music. But, you know, like that is the, that's the, that's amazing when people are like, dude, I'm going back to bed. <laughs> I got to go to sleep. I got to be up right. for three hours for work. And I'm like, you just spent two hours of your more, your early, early, early morning listening to me doing, you know, a, a Michael Jackson song. That's what a, that's a, the highest compliment that you can be paid. Amen. Because time is really important. Your listeners' time is really, really important, mm-hmm. and it shouldn't that's be right. squandered. Nope, not at all. And it certainly shouldn't Agreed. be squandered for fucking dollar bills. <laughs> Amen. Amen to that, brother. <laughs> you know? Cheers. <laughs> Cheers to that, brother. Oh, there it is. Hey, so tell me, uh, we did this thing called a hidden talent. Do you have any? Yes, I have a I have an amazing hidden talent in that uh, I can find you the best <laughs> breakfast spot in any city that we are visiting. There's a lot really? of value in that. A lot of value in that. Okay, I'm impressed. We're gonna yeah, have yeah. to go on tour yeah. then. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. I have a I have a I have some kind of I think it's a part of my Asperger's superpowers that I can hone in on the best breakfast spot in a city. Simply by closing my eyes and willing it into existence. Nice. I love it. <laughs> Where's the best one in LA? Uh, Blue Jam on Melrose. He has a couple of other locations. I just happen to enjoy the Melrose location. Uh, okay. is, my, is my favorite breakfast in LA. And then my favorite breakfast burrito is uh, at the Malibu Kitchen in Malibu. It's, it's, the, it's oh, Bill's, yeah. Bill's in Malibu. Bill is a... Um, <laughs> Bill is uh, half of so the the soup Nazi from Seinfeld is half based on Bill and the <laughs> uh-huh. actual real soup Nazi in New York. Okay, it's epic. He's nice. he's one of the greatest characters I've ever met. <laughs> he's st- he's st- he stops serving breakfast at nine thirty. <laughs> All right, <laughs> and and. Closes the kitchen until 1130 prepping for lunch. And I was there the other day and there was a line out the fucking door. And at 930, Bill walks out and it's like, kitchen's closed. We're done. We're prepping for lunch. And six guys back out the door, six people back out the door. Some guy just goes, you're a fucking asshole, Bill. And just <laughs> walks away. And I was like... <laughs> I was like, this, this is the only place in the world where that just happened. That is an extraordinary. Like, You're a fucking asshole. And meant it. Meant every goddamn every word. word. Because yeah. Nobody can understand why breakfast ends at 9.30. It's, it's a 22-minute drive through the canyons. So I yep. would get up at 8 in the morning to drive to make sure that I get a breakfast burrito before the 9.30 cutoff point. I leave myself an, an hour's worth of fuckery just in case there's traffic or a car accident or a helicopter crashed or a dog died just to make sure I can be there by 9.15 to order. Because you can't order at 9.30. Everything ends oh, at no. 9.30. Yeah, everything ends. It's right, incredible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm that's to go my check superpowers. It out. I can find you a great breakfast. Uh, the Squat and Gobble in San Francisco is uh, was my favorite in San Fran. Um, okay. But yeah, it's uh, it's one of my uh, it's one of my things. Uh, Soho House is a ridiculously expensive English breakfast that's off menu. By the way, if it's not on the menu, you have to know that they make it. But it's would be uh, you'd, you'd love this Garrett. It's got the the beans and the bangers and the fucking. It's got it's got the fried tomatoes. It's got everything. It's a nice. mwah. But if you don't oh, know what they make it, don't know there. You don't know. You don't get yep. it. Yep. You don't get it. That's it. You don't get it. You also get heart disease, but you know what? It's actually, like, actually, like, some things are worth it. Actually, kind of some things are worth it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's how I feel about it. So, <laughs> um, I kind of suppose we have to ask then: what is next for you, and also kind of for the sessions? Well, I've just finished watching the fourth season of uh, of the F one series on Netflix. So I'm going to go and be a driver for the Red Bull team. <laughs> Nice. Um, oh, good for you. Good I, for you. Yeah. I, feel qu- I feel fully qualified for that. Uh, so overqualified. Only yeah. if you can beat up Lewis Hamilton. Uh, you know, and I can be a brain surgeon, and I can I can be a detective because I've watched lots of detective shows. Uh, yeah, my hope right. is to. Um, I've, I'm 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 inking my management deal with a company this week. 
who also have a wing of their company that um, are uh, one of the three big publishing companies that own the rights to songs because nice. obviously in the digital world, as we know, you can't simply play songs yeah. on the interwebs uh, because right. the copyright law was uh, written by men in powdered wigs. So that seems like a great <laughs> idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm like Jesus okay. fucking Christ! Really, we're not going to update the copyright law from like a day when people would like pull up in a horse and carriage and be like, "You can't play songs on the internet." Um, <laughs> so the way around that is to have permission from the rights holders. So I've been okay. for the past four years trying to get aligned with a rights holder. So I finally yeah. pulled that off. They're very oh, they're lovely people, and they get what I'm doing because ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're a business person, all I'm doing is raising the awareness of your intellectual property that you've paid a lot of money for. Yeah, amen, and brother. Which is smarter? Take the big, you know, take a check up front for a few thousand dollars, or let me do this thing where everyone's going to be like, "Oh, I should definitely listen to more of the Bee Gees." Bing, 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 bing. Exactly. Um, so that was that's a major that's a major kill for me. Uh, I think that um, you know I might have to come off of Instagram, much as I don't want to, and and move over to I'm going to try Twitch. Um, okay. because I just, uh, I, this, this platform is absolutely just bonkersly poor. Um, and, uh, the other thing about Twitch is it's in stereo. And part of the real joy Perfect. of this thing is that if you listen on headphones, yeah, yeah. you can hear the mix, you know, there's like, there's a guitar right. on one side and a guitar on the other and you yeah, hear yeah. the interplay and then the bass is down the middle and suddenly a world opens yeah, up yeah. that is so much. Cause that's the experience I have. Cause it's it's stereo for me before it yeah. ends up, you know, getting concussed by whatever this fucking cable does. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, I had stereo and Instagram for about two weeks and then they took it away, which didn't make any sense at all. What? But people lost their minds. Yeah. So, you know, much as it. I will, much as I will have the, did, were you there for the stereo moments? I was. I mean, about 10 days of them. It was so they were fucking, gorgeous gorgeous dude like yep. i didn't there was so many songs i didn't get to redo like i wanted to do slave to the rhythm in stereo so people could hear what oh, a masterpiece fuck. that is yeah. um so you know unfortunately i give up the ability for blue check marks to drop in out of nowhere and all that but honestly i don't give a fuck because to me it's like it's much more important now for me to have the experience be as rewarding as possible because that to me is what will drive people to the podcast so right. I want to get a podcast done and then, you know, I would like to get the TV show and then I want to get back on the road. I want to get back doing this, you know, the, the because that's when, that's when it really, it's not that it's more enjoyable, but it's, it's, you know, like that crowd thing is, is, is special. Mm -hmm. That's when the magic happens, brother. Yeah, totally. You know, totally. getting to sit there with 400 people and do prints or 200 people, you know, like I used to do oh, 200 yeah. people a, a month in LA, 200 people in New York, 200 people in San Francisco. And it was yeah. really cool because, mm -hmm. you know, that is where I know, honestly, that's where I, I know that nobody else could do the job. Yeah, right. I think there are other people that could sit and break it down on the interwebs. There are other people that could probably do the podcast, but to sit and make up a show in real time for two hours yeah. in front of 200 people is not That's something that every, yeah, it's not something that no, everybody not at all. can do. Not at all. No, and no, I, and I, I get to do all the things. So, you know, that's the ultimate goal. And then, you know, um, I would like to, uh, I'd probably, I probably, I'm starting to think that I'd like to make another album of my own shit. Nice. Ooh. Um, which I've I've I'd done like twice. Okay. I'll gladly send you one of them. Uh, yeah. That was how I yeah, learned Pro I... Tools. Was I spent a year making my own record after I was done with all the <laughs> all the garbage of the record labels and like trying to write hits and all that. I was like, this is gross. Um, send it over. It's a, it's an entire. I, I decided because it's me. And my first record uh, was a concept record. Well, wow. perfect. <laughs> Aim high, Air Force. You know why wouldn't saying? it be? Yeah, why, Triple why wouldn't it be an hour and a half long concept yeah. record? Um, but, uh, you got to stop yeah, something. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I'm a... Right? I mean, I figured <laughs> yeah. if, I, if I went for that and I failed, I'd just have a regular record. But if I went there and nailed it, then I'd have a concept record. Um, so, you know, I'm starting to think that uh, would be cool. And, and okay. uh, you know, ultimately... 
you know, get to England to right. get the show done over there. Like we had this whole England trip that got canceled because of Omicron. So I'm hoping to get over there for March and April. Mm-hmm. Um, and, okay. and really sort of it's, it's time for this thing to move to the next level for me because mm-hmm. it's right. It's a lot of work, man. I mean, I've yeah. done almost a thousand songs on Instagram now. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, there were days, you know, like election day and Christmas and new years of, 2019, 2020, 2021, sorry. Well, yeah, I did 10 hours. I did 10 songs that day. Oh, you know? wow. Okay. Um, there were, there were pro- all the Thanksgivings just sat on my floor because there was nothing else for any of us to do other than sit on our floors. Um, right, exactly. So it, it, I, need to, I need to move it to other things now and have it feel like it's growing because you know for any of us as creative people stagnation is death mm-hmm. that's right you know yeah, when sure it starts is. to feel like a job you get into trouble yeah yeah you know? yeah you don't want to get up in the morning yep. no it's really you know when you when you're sitting down and you're like fuck you know but the interesting thing is there are days when i've sat down and been fuck and then the music will actually do its medicine to me that it does to the people on the other end and i'll come out of an hour and 10 minutes of you know, doing a boogie wonderland and being like, Oh shit, I feel great. The, you know, all of the oxytocin and everything has done the same juice to me that it's done to the, the listeners. Um, so it really, uh, you know, like that, that's what I, I need to do. I've also, I I think I'm going to secure this little, uh, 50 person room here in Los Angeles. JBL is going to put a little PA in for me and I want, I want to do it with you, Toby, but like, I want to just be able to do whatever I want in that room. Cool. Okay. So if I want to have a bunch of my friends come in and, you know, do a, a acoustic songs, you know, cause the thing that sucks about acoustic songs is that if you have one dude that does six of them and the first one sucked, all six of them are going to suck, but it's way yeah. easier to have an acoustic night if everybody gets one song. Yeah. Right. Because if you yeah, don't yeah. like the song, it's three and a half minutes and then another person will come on. It just so happens that all of my friends are fucking barnstorming acoustic people. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's uh, it, it I want to do that. I want to have a room where I can do anything that I want and, you know, sell tickets for 50 bucks, sell tickets for five bucks, sell tickets for free or give away tickets for free because there's no rent on the room. Yeah, and right. I, I, I just... I, I want to, I'm really looking forward to that because that to me is, uh, is that's actually exciting. Hmm. The other yeah, stuff is exciting I, in that way, but this is exciting in like a fuck, we could do anything down there kind of way. Like you and I could just literally sit there and just talk shit for two hours. That's awesome. And Are if there's 10 people, that? no. Okay. Just as it is, I write live, as it right? Is, like that, you know, it's like that, oh. that is also part of it is that I think that the, you know, the the what another thing that we've lost in everything being streamable and everything being a you know you can have it whenever you want it is that things have stopped being special yeah yeah amen to that yeah totally i agree you know and as as somebody said because somebody was bitching him with the chat room about like there was no archive and somebody wrote you can't archive a party that's very true <laughs> yeah very true. well put <laughs> and i was like you know what sir well done <laughs> can't archive a party it's like fucking it's on the it's on the bottom of the t-shirt yeah, uh that's right so yeah that's, so right. that's that's one of the things that i'm really looking forward to is is to hopefully be able to have this room to just to be a blank canvas for and it's all music related that's great you know that's great well like, I'd love it to was be a just it was it. literally just you coming and telling stories of things that you've seen and been in the room for that's a great night if you're a music fan yeah right yeah, amen totally you know, like, why yeah. does it have to be anything more than that? Right. It doesn't. doesn't. You've nope. been in the room for spectacular moments that nobody but you and the other person sitting in that room have been through. That's right. That's right. You've and a bunch of them. A bunch of them. The same with Jimmy. Mm-hmm. The same. I have friends, you know, I have friends who can tell stories that are just bonkers, bonkers. And I'm like, nobody's going to get to hear those stories other than me and the two or three other people that were hanging out high with you one night. Well, let's sit and tell a room full of 50 people those amazing stories. Right. Exactly. You know, and maybe it's story for an hour and then I do a session. Right. On that song. Yeah. Or on anything else, or just fucking like have the crowd pick. Be like, hey, what do you guys want to do tonight? Pantera, Bee Gees, or, or fucking Phil Collins? <laughs> right. Exactly. You do a vote, and the crowd's like, fuck it. Let's do 
Bee Gees and you just get to do Bee Gees that night. Like those are the things where people are like, that's exciting. And that to me is like the, the, you know, the, the, the thing of people being like, dude, I was there when he did the fucking Bee Gees just as, and it was, and then all of a sudden fucking Toby started playing piano and tap dancing. It was the craziest shit I've ever fucking seen. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen anything like Toby is a fucking wicked fucking tap dancer nobody knew. <laughs> you know? And like and people are like, dude, can I see that on the internet? No, no, if you weren't no, there. Nope, it. sorry. It doesn't well, exist anywhere else. Well, he'll deny all play of say he never tap danced right. in his life, but he's lying. He's a fucking great tap dancer. Hidden skills. Hidden skills. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> so that's what I'm looking forward to. Awesome. Excellent. Well, damn, Christian, this has been a really cool and informative session. Unfortunately, we got to kind of get it down. Um, yeah, no. And I, I really enjoyed all the wisdom and the stories and the info. And, you know, it was fun and exciting. And I hope to do it again in the very near yes. future because the part two with you is, you know, we could keep going and going and going. So thank you for, for sure. taking the time to be part of this episode of My Right Stuff. And I will be definitely listening to the sessions IG Live every night at 6 p.m. Pacific mm -hmm. to see what's up next. Unless I go to Twitch. Well, then I'll come over to Twitch <laughs> and listen. Twitch I like that. Too. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking. Awesome. That's right. That's right. So thanks very much. I appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, Bye. <laughs> I have to say as well, it's been an absolute pleasure pleasure to actually kind of catch up with you uh it's been lots of fun it's been uh, a complete blast so i'd like to say thank you very much to you and i'd like to say thank you very much to you beautiful people out there no star take care and we'll catch up with you soon and i'm your host lord toby rage right and this has been another informative and very very fun musical episode of my right stuff remember to listen loud play hard and keep reaching for your dreams thanks for watching and good night do you suffer from insomnia depression or anxiety, well our sponsor Tomes may be able to help you in these areas. Tomes, a natural sleep and sound healing portal, helping people globally get to sleep faster and stay asleep for longer, and you can find this piece of gold at www.tomes.com. That's www.taumhoms.com. Most of all, I'd like to thank all of you beautiful people who stream, download, watch and support My Right Stuff. And please, please keep spreading the word because we really, really appreciate it. Also, we now have a My Right Stuff store where you can pick up some lovely snazzy merch for those beautiful bodies. Just go to myrightstuff.com and click on the store tab. And don't forget to tag us in any photos of the merch so we can include you in a future episode. Please also be sure to subscribe to the podcast channel of your choice, as well as our YouTube channel. Toby says it'll give you 10 years good luck. I'm not so sure. I think it's maybe more. This has been another amazing episode of My Right Stuff, and please be sure to tune in this week, next week, and every week for yet another adventurous and informative show. I'm your co-host, Sir Gareth Dighton, and thank you, my lovelies, for tuning in. No star, you beautiful people, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you for watching My Right Stuff. This episode was brought to you by Tomes, a natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tomes.com. That's www.taumhoms.com.